This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 424, recorded on January 13th, 2017. Wow, I didn't realize it was Friday the 13th. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon DePommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. Did you realize it was the 13th? Friday I did. the 13th? Yeah. You're wearing a black shirt. I'm ready for it. You are? Yeah, today is the day I don't make any mistakes. <laughs> we'll see. You already made one, right? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay. That's right. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Here I am. Yes, good to be here. <laughs> Sorry, I was just I was just sorting out my pick of the week, and it and it uh, it had an autoplay on it, and so I had something else in my headphones at the moment. Alan, do you remember Bob and Ray? <clears throat> Bob and Ray. Bob and Ray. They were a radio show. Yeah, and right. One of them was named Wally Ballou. He was a reporter, and they always cut in halfway through his name, just like you did just now. It says E Blue here. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon, it, it's warmed up since earlier in the week, right? Oh, yesterday was like summer. Yeah, it was seven degrees yeah. Celsius today, probably the same. It's nicely. I don't think so. I here, think it's though. a little bit colder today. It's a yesterday. little colder. It's kind of blustery here. It's supposed to be. Uh, oh, yesterday it was 60 F. It's yeah. crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. Also, yeah, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to actually get to winter temperatures today. Those poor hibernating animals. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Is it 80 degrees got, there? Uh, <laughs> 75 degrees, nice. cloudy. It was rainy this morning. Uh -huh. What's 75 degrees? I haven't done my conversion. You can tell me. Everyone is but. now doing F. I don't know why. Just to, <laughs> see, FYI. You guys are all, you, you folks are all scientists, <laughs> and you should be using Celsius, but I know why you don't want to, so don't, don't argue. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It is gray here, and the temperature... Vincent, when you said last week your app wasn't working, I think it's that same app that I have, and the network is still unavailable. Yeah, I think the I app just died. Oh. I threw it out. I'm back but, to the Apple um, app. They were inept. Uh, it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and I can't do that as easily Celsius. Oh, wait, here I can. Minus four Celsius. Mm, yeah. Oh, it's cold there. Yep. Oh, here it warmed up. Mm -hmm. Right, Dixon? It did. Uh, we have, I think for the second week in a row now, we have a guest in our studio. She was on TWIV 179. Now, who can remember who she is? I wasn't. I, will give you I can. <laughs> I, I can. <laughs> yep. Can any I listener, can. the fourth listener who, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> Trudy, Trudy Ray, welcome back, Trudy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was just going to come by and take a picture in front of the wall of polio, and next thing I'm on yeah, TWIV. that happens. You want to be called Trudy or Gertrude? Trudy is good. Trudy works. Was is dein virus, right? Virus. Maybe we have another German title virus. for this week, too. That would be mm -hmm. cool. Well, welcome. You're here uh, on pleasure, is mm -hmm. that right? That's right. And your family's with you. Yep. Last time you didn't have a family. You had part yeah. of you had a husband, right? Yes, but no kids. Now, now I have kids. two kids. Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah. Oh. Now, Whoa. last time on Twiv, you were a postdoc at the time. Correct. That's correct. So, at the CDC. So, give so us an from update. Viruses to genetics. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I was at the CDC. I was working on RSV. I was a postdoc, and I was kind of staring down a long path of what Rich Condit calls the career postdoc. And I didn't like it. So I started looking at alternative careers in science. And I, you know, kind of thought about the things that I like to do. Uh, I wanted to stay in science, but I mostly enjoy the theoretical aspects like um, reading and writing and thinking about science. And um, an opportunity came up and I am now in patent law. Wow. Did you go to law school? Nope. You're not a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. I am what is called a Whoa. patent agent. Okay. Um, you have to take um, uh, the patent bar exam. It's a federal exam, uh, six hours long. Mm. But uh, once you pass that, uh, basically you are qualified to practice um, with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Mm. 
you get a registration number, and that's that. So you're, the firm you work and with so is, does it specialize in patents. life sciences yes. patents or just yes, local? life science, chemistry, biology. Got it. Sorry, Rich. Go ahead. So you work with a law firm. That's correct. You work with a law firm. Okay. Yes. You, you got it. You have uh, some delay wait. issues there, Rich Condit. Do I? Yeah, you do. Are you on a Wi-Fi connection? Rich is just mailing it in today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you were going to ask something. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I was going to ask whether uh, I, I want to know where Trudy is, where she's located. Oh, I'm in Atlanta. So okay. you mean where do I live or where am I right now? Yeah, uh, right now. She's right, sitting now I I right now, I know where you are right now. Right office. now, you're sitting in. In the Twiv That's, studio. Yes, I am. No, I but want I want to, to say the left. temperature here, here is a very comfortable 25 degrees Celsius. There you go. Very good. In the office, you mean? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> Your phone tells you that, too, interior temperature? I know. It just feels comfortable, so I know that that's room temperature. So. Ah, interesting. So, uh, Trudy, you might want to explain to the listeners out there uh, the kinds of earrings you're wearing. I am wearing double helix earrings. Nice. That's, I didn't know they're they're fantastic. Earrings. Dixon, you can see very well. Ooh. Uh, yes, I can. Very excellent. They're nice. They're nice earrings. Thank you. Do you always wear them or just special for Twiv? Special for Twiv. Yeah. Good do you answer. Have, do you have Good virus answer. earrings also? <laughs> I do not, but I do need oh. some. Oh, yeah. Maybe we should start there. developing a line of uh, jewelry. <laughs> yeah, there are plenty out there. All right, an update on the book contest. Mm -hmm. Infections of Leisure. No, we're not there yet. I think it was uh, 17th. 17th emailer. We're not right, there. Seventeenth. Yes. We're not there. Not, not there yet. I started one on Twim, by the way. Ah. Um, if you are interested, I will not tell you where it is, though. You have to go find it to yourself on your own. I want to welcome another podcast to Microbe TV, Omega Tau. It is the tagline is called "Science and Engineering in Your Headphones." In fact, Dixon and I were on Omega Tau. Dixon will not remember, of course. But we were both on no, I, quite I, a while ago. I, I do recall that. And uh, that Omega Tau is hosted by, it actually comes from Germany, and there's a German and an English version. Mm -hmm. They actually alternate. They do some in German and some in English. And Marcus Volter is a uh, software technologist. He said, told me he's getting his PhD in computer science. And Nora Ludwig is an electrical engineer. So two of them do these episodes, and it's different stuff. It's not life sciences for the most part. It's, uh, you know, engineering and physics and so forth. So I thought it would be a, a nice thing to add, and they're part of the team now. So welcome, cool. Omega Tau. Kathy, what's up with ASV? Well, some of the same things we've been talking about in previous weeks. The meeting is in Madison, Wisconsin this year, June 24th to 28th. It'll be held at the Monona Terrace, and so all of the sessions are all in one building with a beautiful view. And abstracts are due February 1st. If you want to sponsor an abstract, you need to be a paid full member. If you want to apply for a travel grant February 1st, you need to be a member, so that would be for students and postdocs. There are some satellite workshops. We've talked a little in the past uh, about some of them. We just got the program today for the veterinary virology one, and I haven't had a chance to go to the website to see if it's posted, but I'm certain it must be. The program looks very exciting, uh, all about veterinary vaccines, challenges, and breakthroughs. It's organized by Sue Vanderwood, so you can check that out. And then I wanted to especially highlight the career workshop, which is free for students and postdocs to the first 100 that register. And our own Rich Condit is participating in that, and I think he's primed to tell us a little more about it. Hmm. <laughs> right. So this is being uh, organized by uh, Glenn Rawl, and uh, the faculty participants are Lauren O'Donnell and Mavis Abanji McKenna, Carolyn Coyne, Eric Barton, Mark Dennison, and myself. And uh, from we're just in the very early planning stages of this. Uh, but uh, Glenn's vision is not necessarily to talk about career choices, but rather to concentrate on professional skills that are needed most for jobs in the scientific realm. And he gives us some possible examples how to gauge audiences, uh, audiences' capacity and interest, 
how to identify supportive mentors and maximize value from your training experiences, how to give an elevator talk and convince people of the importance of your work without slides, uh, how to build and effectively uh, in, uh, engage professional networks. He envisions maybe a LinkedIn thing of participants afterwards so that we can uh, stay in touch. Um, he has me pegged for, I'm the old guy. This is the old guy's perspective talk again. Uh, he has me picked out maybe as the last speaker to provide perspective for newbies from a guy who's uh, retired on you know what I felt was important as moving uh, through my career. And he really wants to emphasize discussion. Okay, it's not just faculty standing up and yakking at you, but try and encourage some uh, real give and take with the audience. So we'll see how all that works out. Should be fun. I had the impression too that there was going to be some uh, maybe continuing interaction throughout the meeting, or or m- maybe that is just my own impression. I don't know. Well, certainly he wants to seed an ongoing interaction. That's why he mentions uh, LinkedIn and et cetera. He wants to he wants this to be you know the beginning of of something where people can use social networking and et cetera to to stay in touch and and you know build on what we start with the session. So where you find all this information out about the meeting is at asv.org. Click on the link that says annual meeting and then click on the next link that says annual meeting and then bookmark that when you're at the University of Wisconsin meeting site. All right. Thank you. Uh, Unfortunately, we have some sad news. Oliver Smithies is a Nobel laureate from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's died at 91. He was the first faculty member there to win a Nobel. In fact, the first in North Carolina. He got it uh, along with Mario Capecchi and Martin Evans in 2007 for de- uh, developing ways to do uh, mutagenesis. And so uh, I remember when I was there, I had this big banner across the road on campus saying, Our Nobel Laureate. Cool. <laughs> Celebrating that. Even though it's 2007, they still have the sign up. So that's cool. So to, sorry about that. 91, not bad, Dixon. Not bad. That's right. Would you like to reach 91? Absolutely. Yeah, I would too. And he was a pilot too. He was? Huh. Yeah. And it's, how did he die? <laughs> he died of old age. Old okay, age. okay, okay. Old so age. It. Yep. It's a good summary kind over at apoptosis. Uh, UNC. Yeah. On, a, on a lighter note, I've been looking into getting... Well, the podcast trans- oh, yeah, this is, tran- transcribed. This is great. So there's this new online service uh-huh. where you upload an audio file and it transcribes it automatically. I'll be darned. Uh, now, let's like just Google see Translator? <laughs> um, <laughs> Almost, would you, would you read us a line or two I'm going to. That? I'm <laughs> going to. That's the whole point of this. But <laughs> hey, hey. You, have to, you have to pay for this, but it's... Um, Money well spent. You know, the, mm. the problem is there are people who do this manually. They'll read... And type it. It's a cost of fortune to do mm-hmm. that. I've looked into that. It's just way too expensive. Of course, we've had some volunteers, including you, Trudy. You've done mm-hmm. a transcript. It's a lot of work, right? I did three. Yeah. Three. Three. So, wow. um, anyway, this service is going to improve, but I put in episode number one. <laughs> Here's what I got. The very beginning. This is This Week in Virology, episode one, September 12th, 2008. We're going to talk about West Nile virus. I'm Vincent Drac. In yellow. <laughs> I'm here with Dick De Palma. <laughs> Are you uh, Richard De Palma's brother? <laughs> um, uh, I certainly wish I was, but I'm not. And that's only the first few sentences. That's right. It's really funny. It probably gets worse as we go. Well, so there are two things you could do. You could just put it up the way it is, and it's better than nothing. <laughs> right. Or you could go through it, in which case it would take you real time plus to do it to correct it. But, um, uh, I actually figured out a hack that might allow us to do this Mm -hmm. um i'll i'll send you an email describing what i found so far but um this is a uh this is an independent company that's doing this yeah there's um trint it's called t-r-i-n-t were you aware that youtube automatically captions your videos when you upload them yeah yeah how does that is that pretty accurate Mm -hmm. or have you looked it is not bad for stuff that it has reasonable audio. It's uh, it, I've had it. I've mm. checked it for the ones that I've put up. Um, so you can put up with a 
your audio with a picture, so it's a movie. You, yes, right? you put up your audio yeah. with a. Um, so you get a. There's a caption file, and a YouTube's interface is a little mm. weird, but you can dig down in there and actually download a text version of your caption file. Oh, cool. And there are a couple of regular expression expression searches you can do in a text editor that will turn it into something like a transcript. Um, I don't know if that would work with a full TWIV episode, but we could certainly try yeah, it. It's worth trying. It's free. Yeah. Yeah, this one would cost. Um, but it, and again, it makes the episode searchable, which is... Right, exactly. Well, that's why, that's why YouTube does it, so Google can yeah. index your video. Because right now we have a lot of content which nobody can search. I right. think also um, a lot of professors use your podcasts for teaching purposes, and I have done that in the past. And I told I uh, transcribed that particular episode um, for my students to mm. make it easier for them to yeah. understand what you know what yeah. we're talking about. Especially Dixon's part, right? She's not saying anything. <laughs> she became your friend already. I don't have to, to insert say anything now, do I? <laughs> well, it's a podcast. If you don't say anything, it's kind of funny. Uh, right. Okay. That's good. All right, Specialize we, in pregnant silence. We have a couple of follow-ups. First is from Anthony. If the history of polio was vertical spread by caregivers not practicing hygiene, there's no reason to expect diarrhea in a domestic situation from campfire to castle. That would not increase transmission. For a pathogen, that water dispersal is natural like cholera instead of tangential Diarrhea in particular and virulence in general is a suitable strategy. Just a stray thought. <laughs> I don't know, Anthony. I think that's kind of trying to rationalize things, right? It's the way it is, and you don't need diarrhea to spread. I think no. that's the bottom line. And I no suspect when. Pun intended. The bottom line. And I think when you have diarrhea, mm -hmm. there are other reasons, probably, but as we discussed last time. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rich, are you there? Four, five, oh, no. six. Wow, what a delay. Rich Condit. Maybe he's in reboot, reboot mode. He's lost in space. Oh, I am here. I'm sorry. I was on mute. Uh, Oops. Oh, <laughs> mute. <laughs> he turned me into a mute. <laughs> I want you to read Matt's email. Go better. Okay, I'll read Matt's email. You ready? Yes. Yes. Ready. Good morning, distinguished TWIV hosts. My name is Matt Nance, and I've been a listener and devoted fan since episode 65, Matt's Bats, in uh, January 2010. I cannot thank you enough for all the hard work you do and the educational, entertaining hours you've given me on my commutes, bike rides, and post-Netflix binge time over the years. I want to add my understanding of matrix potential to the mix in response to some confusion I heard in episode 423. Having completed an MS degree in soil and water science at the University of Florida, I was beaten over the head with the concepts multiple times and will attempt to share my knowledge here. I actually rode down the hill to Doc, Dr. Condit's building one day to meet him before he retired, a highlight of my years in Gainesville, to be nice. sure. That's a commentary on Matrix how exciting Pot Gainesville is, right? Yeah, I was, was going to say also. it. But. <laughs> Matrix potential refers to the accumulated forces which hold water to soil surfaces and lower the availability of water to plants, fungi, and microbes. Uh -huh. This force is largely a function of capillary effects, but several other forces contribute as well. Essentially, matrix potential refers to the force required to remove water, which is adhered to soil surfaces and pore spaces, and why, uh, and why it is represented by negative values, a negative pressure that holds water as opposed to a positive value, which push water. This force is variable based on many factors, including soil structure, atmospheric variables such as humidity and rainfall, as well as the mineralogy of uh, parent material of the soil. It is important to note that some of these factors can change minute to minute, while some change on a geological timescale. A practical example, after a heavy rain when the soil has been saturated, matrix potential is effectively zero, as water is readily available and little or no energy is required for acquisition, uptake, acquisition or uptake into organisms, diffusion, osmosis, etc. As the excess water drains, the water which remains is found on soil particle surfaces and in porous spaces within soil where capillary forces cause it to be retained. 
Whenever the organism's ability to exert partial pressures for water acquisition is exceeded in magnitude by the matrix potential of the water-soil system, said organism is no longer able to acquire water until the matrix potential is raised sufficiently to allow for acquisition or uptake to resume. Again, matrix potential is a negative value and saturated systems have a matrix potential of zero. I don't know of a scenario in, in nature in which matrix potential would be positive. And so, the curing of <laughs> fungi using matrix potential is essentially sorting them by the ability to acquire water from various systems wherein the matrix, res matrix retains water with variable force. This would be why the relative amount of germination decreases as matrix potential decreases, and also why no germinations occur at minus 5 or minus 6 uh, MPA. That was... Um, millipascals. Uh, the pressure is just too low for the fungi to have access to water for growth. This is my quick coffee shop summary, and I'm sure I've severely <laughs> dumbed down the subject, but hopefully this helps somewhat. I'm certain my soil physics professor would love to read this explanation and clarify my <laughs> simplifications with gusto. Thank you again for all the learning and laughs. So this has okay. to do with trying to cure the yeah. fungus uh, from last time, that's associated with white nose disease in bats, cured of its virus. Right. 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 And so thank you, Matt, because I was puzzled by it, and Rich and I both said we had tried to figure out more about it, and this was mm -hmm. much better than anything I read online. Yes, this is yes. good. Good learning, Matt. They must have taught you well there in Gainesville. Very good. <laughs> Kathy, can you take that's Ryan's? Cool. Sure. Ryan writes, hello, Vincent and friends. I'm writing in regards to the email you received in TWIV 423 about HPV purification, that's human papillomavirus, purification affecting infectivity, as well as a shameless attempt to snag some more reading material. <laughs> Although I don't have much experience with viruses, minus M13, I do know a thing or two about nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. When gold nanoparticles are introduced into the bloodstream, various proteins adsorb to the surface of the particle to form a protein coat called a protein corona. Depending on what proteins non-specifically adsorb to the surface of the particles, it can affect their distribution within the body. Although gold nanoparticles aren't exactly viruses, seeing as nature loves to follow Murphy's Law, it wouldn't be surprising for the adsorption of host proteins and other biomolecules to alter how the virus interacts with the body. As with all things in science, further study of this could yield some interesting results. Thanks again for a great podcast. I'm currently a graduate student in Toronto studying optogenetics, an enlightening experience, <laughs> where it is a warm minus two Celsius. <laughs> Your frequent discussions have kept me company throughout my undergrad and as of a week ago into graduate school as well. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Ryan. I think this email was sent for the book contest. Yes. Uh, which, to remind everyone, it's for a book called Infections of Leisure. And all you have to do is write an email with the subject line, infections. I think it's infections of leisure. Um, yes. And be the 17th emailer, if I have that right. Could have this all wrong. <laughs> all right. That was the last one. Very good. All right. We have a lot of papers today. We have two snippets, so we'll make them quick and a longer paper. Um, and the two snippets are about prions or prions. What do we favor here? Dixon, how do you say it? Prions. Prions. Trudy? Prions. Prions. Kathy? Hmm. Prions. Rich? I always say prions. Alan? I say prions. I think, didn't Stan Prusiner say prions? Yes. Mm -hmm. prions? I think so. You know, it doesn't matter because it's a manufactured word. Uh, right. But a lot of textbooks actually yep. have the pronunciation in there and they say P R E. E. That's how it's pronounced. Uh, interesting. Okay, prions. Hmm. Anyway, two papers in science, translational medicine. The first, or one of them. Published. Oh, just, just a minute, sorry. Mm. Uh, I know that there's two other words, prion. One is a bird, and one that's spelled P-R-E-O-N, and that's a theoretical subatomic particle. Mm. Oh. So <laughs> it could be that the bird prion. one is pronounced differently. <laughs> I don't be. know. Could be. I have a picture of a street somewhere in the world, a street sign, 
Prion Road. <laughs> now, I don't know if it came after Prions or before, but maybe it's another word. Might be named after the bird. P-R-I-O-N. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm, could be. It's a lovely picture. Maybe it'll be the episode picture. Maybe. Very right, good. Susan? Maybe. Uh, these are back-to-back papers in Science Translational Medicine. The first called Detection of Prions in Blood from Patients with Variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob Disease. Uh, the mm-hmm. first author is Concha Marambio, and the last author is Claudio Soto. These are from University of Texas, uh, un- uh, the F- University of the Andes in Chile, um, a foundation in Milan, University of Edinburgh. Got that, folks? Edinburgh? Very Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. Not Edinburgh. No. I, got, I got corrected years ago here on TWIV. Not Edinburgh. <laughs> Second is detection of prions in the plasma of pre-symptomatic and, as- and symptomatic patients with variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob. First author is Daisy Bugar. The last author is Joliette Coste. And as you might guess, these are from France, University of Montpellier, and um, a bunch of others, which I'm not going to read through. So they both have to do with detecting prions in the blood, and particularly variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob, which is a kind of prion disease you get if you eat meat that's contaminated with the prions of bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. Now, prions, of course, are proteins. We have normal prions in us. It's, it's called the prion protein. It's encoded by a gene. And the diseases occur. They're spongiform encephalopathies. They're chronic degenerative neurological diseases. They occur when the protein starts to misfold. It can spontaneously misfold, and you get something called spontaneous or sporadic Kreutzfeldt-Jakob. Or you can have a genetic predisposition where you have a mutation in the gene, and that predisposes you to misfolding. Or you can acquire prions. You can acquire them from transfusions, from corneal transplants, from growth hormone, or eating the wrong hamburger, I guess. It doesn't matter if it's well done, because these prions are very, very hard to inactivate. So are the they alive? Oh. No, they are not alive. No. They are oh. just proteins. They're just proteins. On the, on the other hand, I mean, yes, <laughs> good question. It, does, it does appear to be possible to get this by eating BSE-contaminated meat, but the, the transmission does not seem to be very efficient. There have been, yeah. what, 200 and some odd cases, 231 so cases far. of this yeah. so far reported, mostly in the U.K., um, but it's pretty scary because it's uniformly fatal. It is, it is fatal. very scary because it's untreatable, yep. uniformly fatal, and neurodegenerative. So it's a, it's a terif- terrifying condition. But it is. it's an exceedingly rare condition, and it's not clear what caused, well, what really causes these people to develop it when yep. a lot more people than that were obviously exposed mm. to beef yeah. that was probably contaminated with these prions. Um so, you know, at the the time that was unfolding in the in uh, the 90s. That's a good it was, pun. Yeah, it was, it was unfolding. <laughs> <laughs> but um from the um diagnostic methods that they use in these papers, can we tell what the incubation period is? I don't think I saw that information. Do we know? Well, there is a study where they they had banked serum from blood donors who some of whom subsequently developed variant right. CJD and from that they could determine at least how far back they could pick up prions, and we can, we'll can we find it when we go across it. But the incubation period can be years for this particular Decades. variant or longer, yeah. And there's still people coming down with, with this disease from consuming meat back in the 90s. It's true. Right. Because we seem to have cleaned up the, the cow problem. You know, we were feeding them a uh, meal that was derived from animals with prion diseases like scrapie. And so we st- they stopped doing that over. Well, and the not UK. just not just meal. They were actually grinding up slaughterhouse offal and yeah, and you know, spines tissue. and such, which yeah, the would brain be tissue in particular. The brain tissue problem, yeah. would be where this was, and and that was being fed to okay. the cattle. So um, they stopped doing that in the. They stopped the doing that. Peak the peak of the epidemic seems to have gone. However, there's still people around who develop disease, and they think there are people who are asymptomatic and may never develop disease. And of course, if they give blood, this is a big problem. Yeah. And that's, so that's why they, we would like to have a blood test, and that's what these two papers are describing. Mm. Yeah. And the, the, both papers use a technology which is pretty cool uh, called protein misfolding cyclic amplification, huh. kind of like a PCR for proteins. It's a really right. neat technology. It's actually developed over 10 years ago, 
and uh, many labs have been trying to refine it and get it to be specific. And essentially, if you think of the idea that a prion, when it becomes pathogenic, it's misfolded, it forms aggregates in, in your brain. So they take advantage of this. Uh, important, uh, importantly, what happens is the misfolded protein, if a normal protein, normal version mm-hmm. of the protein, interacts with the misfolded protein, it not only aggregates, but it assumes the misfolded conformation. It's as if mm-hmm. the misfolded guy seeds similar misfo- identical misfolding in normal protein, right. and then they aggregate, and the aggregation causes a pathology. It's but like it's an also anti-chaperon. The basis of this. <laughs> it's all the basis of this. Uh, you know, I do a lot of watching how it's made, and every time I watch how automobiles are made, I see a, a thin film of, of metal go to a press, and the next thing you know, it comes out looking like the hood of the car. And I imagine that's how this works in your yeah. brain. It just keeps, like uh, the, the apprentice for the wizard, just keeps making the same thing again and again. So if you were to ingest, you know, mad cow prions, they would make their way to your CNS and then cause your normal prion proteins to misfold right. and then eventually you develop the disease. But the, the misfolding is accompanied by an aggregation forming long oligomers of the misfolded protein. So in this PMCA, what they do is they put some a sample that supposedly has some misfolded prion protein in it mm-hmm. and then they mix it with monomers of a normal protein. Right. And then they try and get the conditions such that the the monomers are converted to, converted to oligomers and periodically they sonicate this mixture to break up the oligomers and then do more incubations so they do cycles of incubations and sonication and the what happens is you make monomers you break them up and then you can make more you can use those as seeds to make more uh, oligomers as well what and then, kind of containment do you do this for? i was just thinking of that <laughs> alan you know a p5 facility I no you don't have to do p5 uh, <laughs> really no i I don't think this is acquired by inhalation. It's really? It's into your eye, do you think? No. Well, if you put a corneal transplant in with yeah. a contaminated cornea. Because, yeah, I mean, if, no, if, if it gets into your eye. If we're really believing that this is spread through ingesting, and by the way, a lot of the people who have developed VCJD, I believe, um, worked in slaughterhouses, mm-hmm. hmm. which would suggest a higher level of exposure than just eating the meat. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't mention but uh, no, they don't get into the epidemi- epidemiology of it, but there are no. I mean, the containment, where, the, the containment yeah. that's used, they don't mention. Now, I happen to know a fellow at Rocky Mountain. I'd want it in some kind of a cabinet. <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> those sure. people don't wash their hands as they should. Right. I think if you did this in a biological safety hood, at least uh, BSL two, you'd be okay, right? I have something. Where is it from? Oh, this is just from some individual institution, but it says. Biosafety level two or three, depending on the activity with most human prions treated as BSL-3 under most right. conditions. Mm. And everything Prion- is, uh, I presume, incinerated afterwards rather than sterilized with some fluid like chloride. You know, it's interesting. There was recently a case where uh, an individual came into the emergency room because he shot himself. And, uh, you know, he came in with brain matter coming out. And it turned out he had a, this, a prion disease, so he's gone crazy. Shot himself. Oh they found out later the whole emergency room was contaminated with his brain matter. Oh. They had to destroy tens of thousands of dollars oh worth of equipment because they can't sterilize it. You have yeah. To, yeah. But I also wanted to add that I think the decision uh, t- uh, whether this should be a BSL 3 or 4 doesn't just have to do with whether it's um, you inhale it, whether it's airborne. I think it also has to do with whether or not there's treatment and cures. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And in this case, there aren't any. Nothing. There aren't any. But I, what what really brought this to my mind was mm-hmm. um, the sonication. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so you're potentially aerosolizing this it. stuff. Right. And a BSL-3 would certainly make a lot of sense in that case because yeah. you've got something that you're aerosolizing yeah. that could um, mm-hmm. could kill you 30 or 40 years from now. Right. Yeah, well, I should ask. Uh, Brian, Byron Coye is at the uh, Rocky Mountain Labs where there is a BSL-3 and a BSL-4. Right. And uh, yeah, I could ask him because I asked him some other questions. So here's a great, yeah. great new occupation for people who are retired exactly. from science. They could okay. become prion biologists. And if that's right. If they got <laughs> infected, <laughs> who the heck I'm cares? You, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be 90 right. next year. You know, come on. <laughs> so the the way so when you do this PCMA, if you uh, get misfolded proteins, the, a characteristic PMCA. a characteristic of those 
is that they're resistant to proteinase K digestion. So the normal protein is completely digested. Mm -hmm. When you digest the misfolded protein, you get a few very specific fragments, which you can then de detect on a Western blot. So that's how they assay mm -hmm. uh, the production of misfolded proteins. Mm -hmm. So they have refined this method, basically, in these two papers in, in so, ways that I don't want to go into. So but. one way to get around this, <clears throat> I was just thinking out loud here, that if you could somehow attach the prion or prion to the side of a plastic well like you do for an ELISA test, so it could never come off, but it could still serve as a template, then the only growth that you could observe was in the normal protein. And if you labeled it, then it gets hotter and hotter and hotter as you washed, and that, that could be the essence. So what's the purpose of this? Fix? To avoid contamination by mm -hmm. aerosolization. I don't know if it would stay stuck to the side. That's the problem. Well, right? You don't yeah. know. None of these people, the people have been working on this for 12 no, years. No, I, so. I just think. There's a lot of centrifugation and uh, got it. sonication involved, running yeah. gels, you know, yeah. so we'll find out. Anyway, in, the, in one paper, they have blood samples from 14 patients that had confirmed variant creutzfeldt jakob And when I say confirm, that means they're dead because the only way you yes. can confirm diagnosis yes, right. is to do post-mortem analysis of brain tissue, yeah. do a Western blot, basically, after digestion with proteinase K. Right. They also had people samples from people affected by other neurodegenerative diseases or non-neurodegenerative diseases, so 86 in all, healthy individuals, 49. So all the 14 variant samples were positive. Uh, for in this PCMA assay, and none of the uh, others were positive. So that's good, but of course the numbers are small, so they have and to And they look did at those, I, what was, did both of these papers do those blinded? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think so. Yeah. They don't say, they don't say in, the, in, the, in one of the papers, they don't say they did it blinded, uh, at least uh, not uh, in, the, in the regular text, but in, in the other okay. one, it definitely is blinded. Vincent, I'm not sure which one, which paper you're talking about, but um, one of the ones they did have some samples that had the other kind of uh, CJD, the spontaneous. Yeah, they had it in this one. Sporad none of them were positive. Okay. So in this right. sam in this paper, which um, I can't look at now because my computer is frozen. Excellent. Oh dear. Hold on a sec. Let's get it. What was the temperature outside, Beth? It's very cold. <laughs> very cold. Well, I'm going to have to move. See, see you guys. <laughs> He's yes, leaving. I have to move. He's not <laughs> kidding. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm sorry to have to leave you. But, the uh, Daisy Bugar paper has 67 with variant CJD and 67 with spontaneous CJD. Wow. And uh, So the paper I've just been discussing is um, not the one with asymptomatic in the title. It's just detection of prions in blood from patients. That's Concha Marambio. Right. Uh, you know, they had okay. six um, S, S spontaneous uh, samples, and they were all negative. And, and I just gave you the information wrong. I read the commas wrong. So Yeah, so the spontaneous, yeah. of course, is a different kind of prion disease where you, you don't acquire it. It just happens spontaneously. Your proteins start to misfold. And apparently, this test is very specific for uh, variant CJD. So and the, the, they can use very little uh, amounts of blood to do this. 0 0.37 microliters is enough wow. to detect it. And it turns out there is between 1 and 10 LD50s per milliliter of blood uh, of prions, hmm. according to this test. So it's very sensitive and seems to be specific, at least for these small numbers. <laughs> Samples, right? Yeah. There was a big controversy in the cattle industry as to whether they should continue to do an online test for this um, or should they institute one where one didn't exist. And I remember the outbreak in Alberta in just two cows. It trashed an entire cattle industry of, of Alberta because nobody wanted their beef anymore. So they now, I think, they test every animal. In the United States, I don't think we do that. Yeah, we don't. I know we don't. We don't test every animal. But I think in so Alberta, test, they do. This test has, was originally developed to test cattle. Right. They take scrapes Absolutely. of the nasal cavity. and Sure. Um, so that would make it easier because, I mean, how do you test them if you don't have an, a non-invasive assay? Yeah, right? That exactly, was the problem. Right, exactly. Right. The test, in fact, was developed in Claudio Soto's lab. That's the uh, senior author on the paper with Concha Marambio. Mm -hmm. So that was back in 2001. It was published in Nature. Well, it's actually, 
um, for cattle, you don't need a non-invasive test because if they're going to be slaughtered for beef, yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> you could just you exactly. could section the brain and proteinase K treat it and and do yeah. the standard test. Yeah. Section, um, yeah. But if you're going to, that's a long test for, though for human food. Though, I mean, if they're in the same line, you don't want to be cutting them open and having things contaminating everywhere else. I think you want well, a course. blood test. You would like a blood I test. I think you want a blood test. Yes. I, okay, yeah, I see your point. <clears throat> and that w- they, they're also doing some nasal washes because it turns out they're shed in nasal secretions mm. as well. The other paper is, as Kathy was mentioning, detection of prions in the plasma of pre-symptomatic and symptomatic patients. So this is more or less the same assay, but they had some uh, different samples here which are quite interesting. They have 152 samples from French and British patients, 18 with variant CJ, 67 with spontaneous, and then 67 with non-CJD neurological diseases, 104 healthy controls. So all the variant cases were positive. One out of the uh, 67 S spontaneous were po- was positive, um, which... Um, it's not bad, but it's not perfect, obviously. And then that made Rich ask, why is this test specific for variant prions anyway? <laughs> so I asked Byron Cawhey, who I happen to know because I visited Rocky Mountain Labs and uh, did a, actually did a TWIV with him a while ago. Uh, and he said, PMCA has been orders of magnitude more sensitive for variant than SCJD for the, some reason that at least I don't understand. Okay, so he's an expert and he doesn't understand. So when it comes to detecting low levels of prions in the blood, uh, VCJ is easier to, to detect, even though low levels of prions can also be present in SCJ patient blood. The VCJD and SCJD prions have different conformations, which presumably influences their different seeding efficiencies with a given substrate molecule and potentially cofactor requirements. With RRTQUIC assay, so he has a variant of this, uh, called RTQUIC. There are some PRPC substrates that detect variant and and uh, sporadic with similar sensitivities and others that detect one and not the other. Virtually all variant CJ cases are homo- homozygous for a methionine at codon 129, and therefore their um, prion protein also contains methionine. However, the same is true of many sporadic cases, so this should not be the decisive discriminating factor in these assays. Okay. So the other issue that they had here, the other part of the study, in France since 1999, they uh, store blood from all blood donors. And here I have to say this. They're stored for five years by the Etablissement Français du Sang. Love it. The French Blood (laughs) Service. Is that MI5 or 6? You spoke French. (laughs) (laughs) So three of 27 patients who developed... uh, Variant CJG had been regular blood donors, so they have their blood, fortunately. So this shows you that, you know, you're healthy, you, you feel no problem. There's no reason to think you have variant incubating in you, and then you give blood, and then you give it to someone else. Mm, right. So, yeah. uh, you know, this, this is obviously very good for blood banks to know, this information, these diagnostic tests. But what does it mean for the patients? Like how, you know, especially for nothing. health practitioners, it's, how do they handle nothing. the situation? The, the benefit of these tests is that you can keep the blood supply yeah. clean. It has no benefit for the patient because there's no treatment. There's but no treatment, yeah. presumably right. there will be at some point. Yeah. Right? People are working on it. Uh, many, many labs have tried screening for drugs that inhibit prion formation. As you can imagine, this um, PCMA assay is a good assay to look for drugs, but nothing yet. Anyway, you're you're originally- we did a, a we did a we did a twelve a while ago on a uh, an M thirteen protein that was an anti aggregation protein mm-hmm. that was a that was a potential therapy. So right, there are ideas out there. Hmm. So, Judy, your question: How soon? How early can you detect that? According to this study of these donors, uh, they um, got it positive fourteen months. 16 months before the appearance of clinical signs. Hmm. And that's just limited uh, there was by the samples one they have. 30, right. 31, 31 months before uh, pay, one of the patients was uh, 31 months, uh, yeah. positive. 31 months. Before clinical and onset. the cool right. thing, cool, cool slash scary, is that, that patient in particular, but both of them in general, 
have you know they have a series of uh, blood draws mm. and they're negative 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 and boom then they're positive and they're positive it's really very convincing for this uh, uh, being diagnostic right so and and they say somewhere in the paper that the average time to death from the onset of clinical symptoms is uh, two years uh, and so these people the longest one it, you know you don't know what it means that they're all of a sudden showing up with uh, with a signal in their blood that you don't know if it means that that's when they acquired it mm -hmm. or that's just when the concentration was high enough to detect. Mm -hmm. But it's at least 31 months. Mm. So they, uh, this has to be approved, of course, before it can be used. Right. But I think if they can do more studies, and there are a lot, a lot of, <laughs> the problem is there are not a lot of patients, right? So you're limited. If there are only 230-some variant CJD patients globally, be hard, but right. I think it's cool, and uh, it keeps yeah. the blood supply clean. Now, Dixon asked me before the show, why are we doing this? This is not a virus. Correct. That's what I asked. <laughs> What's, what is a virus, Dixon? Oh, virus has a genome. It has to have a genome, huh? Yep. But prions have been, have kind of fallen in with virology <laughs> for... Right. For a long since, time. since they were first discovered, nobody else, nobody else would pay attention. <laughs> I think every yeah. virology course yeah. includes a, a chapter on prions. But remember, in the nobody beginning, else, nobody else wanted anything to do with them because exactly they're obviously right. not bacteria or protozoans or any other, you know, precisely. And and other diseases. Early on, um, there was some thought that they might have genomes. Fact, right. They might have RNA. And today, you will still find people who say, ah, there has to be some... Well, you, those are the anti-vax people, too. Though. But <laughs> it's been proven now that you can initiate these with, with just protein. But right. uh, I think they're really interesting, and I teach them in my course, my virology course also, so because they're fascinating. It's tradition, then. Let's just say mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Tradition. Tradition. Isn't that a song? It is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is, that, is that Fiddler on the Roof? That's right. Wow. Yeah. I wanted to mention just a slight little twist to the assays that are described in the two different papers. There's some inherent inhibitory activity for the PCMA reaction. And so one of them uses uh, sarcosyl to uh, get rid of the effects of those inhibitors. Mm. And the other one maybe doesn't necessarily get rid of the effects of the inhibitors, but it concentrates the starting material by using beads that have uh, plasminogen on them and that captures the prion proteins and and so may allow washing out of more of those inhibitors or something like that. So I thought those were two different interesting twists to the assays. Mm. Yep. Yeah, they have been working on these for many years and they're getting really good. They're pretty specific and sensitive as you could see. Okay, uh, we have one more paper for you. This is a article in Nature Communications. Mm -hmm. The title is Marine Origin of Retroviruses in the Early Paleozoic Era. I, I picked this for you, Dixon, because Paleozoic <laughs> is kind of how old I am. your era. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I fit right into that concept. Also, there are a lot of fish in the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't like saltwater fish, right? Oh, no, that's not true. Uh, no, I've done a lot of fishing. You know, I understand you can, you can do fly fishing in the ocean, you right? Yeah, of course. Do you fishing. do that? Do yeah, you do, do that? Yeah, I fish for bonefish, striped bass. Off Mexico, right? And other places, too. Long Island. Lots of places. In fact, you can wherever there's salt water, you can try to fish for them. <laughs> you probably don't catch very many lobe-finned fish, though. You know, you got to go deep. you got to go deep. <laughs> got to go really, go really deep with that. <laughs> the authors, and this is an entirely uh, computational biological paper yeah. done from the, univers uh, the University of Oxford, the Department of Zoology. The authors are Pakorn Ausakun and Aris Katsurakis, and it is, I think, really cool. What they're trying <laughs> to do here is figure out how old are retroviruses. And the reason you can do this is not because we have old samples, it's because, as everyone should know, uh, these viruses integrate their genomes into the host genome, and therefore you can find them when you sequence host genomes, which we're doing, we're sequencing everything on Earth. We're getting more and more animal sequences of all sorts. And you can find the endogenous retroviruses that are the consequence of infection. So you can start to date because, of course, you know how animals are related phylogenetically and evolutionarily, and you can start to date the genomes that are within them. 
Now, the uh, oldest age estimates for retroviruses are about 100 million years, and this is derived from studying mammalian retroviruses and their endogenous retroviruses. So the endogenous retrovirus, of course, is what is the DNA copy that's integrated when you, the cell is infected by a, an exogenous retrovirus. Uh, but they think that they're, they're much older, and that's what this paper is about. And to, to look at it, they've turned to a kind of retrovirus, which I'm not sure we've ever discussed here on TWIB, the foamy viruses. <laughs> Subgroup of retrovirus. The genus is called Spuma retrovirus. And I have here a little bit of history for you. The name foamy virus was coined in the 1950s to acknowledge the spontaneous emergence of typical foamy cytopathic effect produced in response to infection, characterized by multinucleated syncytia and vacuolization, leading to a foamy appearance. These are really cool because what's in the virus particle is DNA, not RNA, as in the uh, other retroviruses. So what happens here, these, these viruses um, infect cells, the DNA is transcribed to form RNA and produces proteins, the virus replicates, the RNA is packaged, and then the RNA is reverse transcribed in the virus particle, so what ends up being released from the cell is a particle containing DNA. It's kind of like hepatitis B viruses in that in that sense. So principles uh, of virology. It's like hepatitis B with the, with, with the, import, with the important difference that uh, in the case of hepatitis B, the DNA that goes in is never integrated. But in the right. case of the foamy viruses, the DNA after it enters the cell is integrated. Mm -hmm. I, that's, uh, I presume, a prerequisite for the trans, uh, transcription. transcription. Exactly. So it, yep. it, it, by, by it, 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 it's obligated to basically leave this record of its uh, right. presence. Well, Principles of Virology, Volume 1, page 215, also has a nice little background section. Lovely. <laughs> Did you just have that off the tip of your tongue? Yes, I made a pho photocopy of that Lovely. page. Yeah. Lovely. Anyway, the reason they look at, at uh, foamy viruses, they have a stable history of co-speciation with their hosts. They tend to stay with one host and not jump around, so you can track them uh, more, more easily. There's a, quite a bit of sequence data, uh, and so they set out to look for more. Now, recently, some new ones have been discovered in fish, foamy viruses in fish, including one of my favorite fishes, the coelacanth, which I always yeah. catch when I go fishing. They're, kind of <laughs> fish. They're Apparently, they don't taste very good. <laughs> well, you know, they do fish for them, though. They do. They're a commercial fishery off the coast of Madagascar. That's where they are found. And the first coelacanths were actually found in fishermen's nets. Yeah. Right. Excellent. But I, I so don't they think do they them. were going after them deliberately. Um, perhaps. I not. think they were just they were just trawling deep ah. water and came up with some right. of those. So they have a coelacanth, foamy virus, a, a platy fish or platy fish, zebra fish. Mm -hmm. And the anal and these have been published before. The phylogenetic pattern matches that of perfectly of vertebrates. And it's been nice. suggested that these are very old, and so they're wondering if um, getting more data would, would support that. Mm -hmm. So in this paper, they identify 36 novel lineages of amphibian and fish, uh, fish, um, foamy virus-like endogenous retroviruses, or FLERVs, F-L-E-R-V-S, <laughs> FLERV. Is that a German word? No, it's a, it's a new pitch that some uh, baseball players have worked out. And uh... <laughs> I so wanted a, an author named Phineas on this paper. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, or Cecil and Loeb. Yeah. The, the basic conclusion here is that this major group emerged over 450 million years ago in the early Paleozoic. 450, that's about a long time About the time, time when back. jawed vertebrates emerged. There you go. All of this happening in the sea, right, Dixon? Absolutely. That's the first thing. So maybe retroviruses originated in the sea. Could happen. You know, spread through all the new yeah. animals that yeah. that occurred during the Cambrian explosion, which yeah, yeah, is about yeah. this time. And then they, right. they moved on to land, and then their viruses came with them. Yep. And just to put that in perspective, the, the early Paleozoic, like the Ordovician, um, that they're talking about in this paper that does not just predate dinosaurs that predates like 
post coal. I mean, it's just exactly. it's before exactly. it's really before the carboniferous. Is exactly correct. Predates right. coal. Predates <laughs> coal. <laughs> but not natural gas. <laughs> so with no, that said, we've had with us all. the title should be Viruses Predate Coal. That's right. Wow. Yeah. So the way they do this is they use the coelacanth reverse transcriptase nice. sequence and they screen, they simply screen all the sequences in GenBank that bank databases. Yep. And they pick up 1,700 reverse transcriptase sequences, uh, and they do more analysis. And this is really lovely. They go through uh, iteration and reiteration of this. They, they uh, identify potentially full-length foamy retroviruses of the FLIRVs, let's say, right. uh, and different species like newts and cichlids. So they essentially use this, this initial RT that they pulled out as bait, and they yep. do fishing. They fish, oh. and then what they pull out, they try to <laughs> assemble. That's right. They're fishing, and then they make full length, and then they take their full length. They try and look at the open reading frames, uh. and then they can identify proteins and go back and search with those as well. Right. Um, they do this over and over and over, and, and basically mm. they get uh, how many full length? Uh, a handful of full length uh, flurves they pull out. Um, and they they begin to analyze these uh, by the typical tools. That they find that uh, many of these uh, animals, salamanders, lobe-finned fish, ray-finned fish, the flurves, appear to be monophyletic. That is, they had a common ancestor. Um, the mammalian seem to be very related to salamander flurves, more so than lobe-finned fish, which is a mirror of the host evolutionary relationship. And so they say this supports the idea that these are co-speciating uh, the, this retroviral lineage with their, with their hosts. Right. <clears throat> they have a lot of trouble because there are lots of mutations in these uh, genomes, of course, and they have to try and get around that by patching in sequences and looking for homology and trying to figure out what the open reading frames are. So there's a lot of manipulation here, uh, but they do end up getting some full-length uh, open reading frames. Um, the, in, this, uh, in, the figure that, in the figure that they show, they, have, they show four full-length guys. Right. I don't know if that's the uh, full extent of it, or those are just examples. There aren't many more than those, I think. I think that you mentioned that uh, uh, the sequences that initially pull out have a bunch of mutations in them and stuff. I think the, the sorting that out was really interesting because they used the same sequences to reprobe the organisms that they came from and find other fragments, right, right, other right. herbs or fragment herbs from the same creatures and use all of those sequences together uh, to deduce the sort of uh, minimum uh, or uh, most parsimonious uh, ancestral uh, genome. Mm -hmm. and some of these are like relative to other retroviruses, huge. We're talking about 12 KB as opposed to the typical mm. eight or nine. Right. So one of them, the NVI, what is the NVI? can't remember which one that is. They I think have, that may be a newt. Could be. They have two, I'll L, look it up. They have two LTRs. Yes, and, that's and, and, and viridescence. And they that enables them to date the integration time because, remember, the two LTRs are flank the genome, and if the virus is growing on its own, these uh, will mutate according to the rate of the viral error rate. But once they integrate, the mutation rate slows down so that they can calculate how much these have changed, and they have two of them, so they can calibrate it, and they can figure out uh, when this thing went into the genome. And so the NVI FLIRV, they estimate to be 14 million years ago, it went into the genome. Okay, so it's infecting, and then 14 million years ago, it went to a particular host, and today we have uh, you know, relatives of that, and we know how much it's mutated. It's pretty cool. They do that with a couple of the other ones uh, as well. And they, yeah, and a couple, a couple of the other ones appear uh, appear younger, like yes, uh, a million years or so. And when they talk about those, they talk about a million years, and they talk about it like it was like yesterday, right? right? Yeah, young. They call them young, uh, and, and talk about the possibility that maybe there's some relative of this guy that's still active or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of what they do here is to annotate these sequences, so they want to say well, what are the proteins, and we know that the foamy retroviruses have a core set of proteins, and they can see many of these. You know, the RT and the uh, the, uh, envelope and so forth. But there are other accessory proteins in these um, foamy viruses, and they see some of those here, but they also have some proteins that don't look like uh, anything else. 
Uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, unknowns here. Um, they do uh, then use the polymerase sequence to try and align uh, and do phylogenetic analysis of these. And when they do that, get a little bit more ro- robust than using the RT. Uh, they find that rayfin, from rayfin fish, lobefin fish, and salamander, they f- again, they form a well-supported monophyletic clade. Um, and more support for the idea that these co-speciated with mammals. Now, the bottom line here is um, how old are all of these viruses? We know when they went into the genome, you know, 14 million years ago. But how old are they? Because they've been around longer than that, probably. And so what they do is they uh, calculate backwards from the se- all the sequences that they have, and they, you know, they can estimate the evolutionary rate, and then figure out uh, how old these viruses are based on the number of mutations in the genome. And they do something here that was new to me that I didn't recognize before, and that is um, estimates of the rate estimates of mammalian uh, foamy virus evolution are time dependent. It's actually true for most viruses, and this is new. And I went and looked it up. So it turns out we all know that DNA viruses and RNA viruses have different mutation rates due to the uh, inability of RNA viruses to correct errors. But when you look over long periods of time, they all look to have this about the same mutation rate, which is contrary to what we think based on the polymerase error frequency. Right. Turns out that with time, the error rates slow down. So for all viruses, they become more or less the same over long periods of time. So there's hope for me, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Your mutation rate is... So as I get older, I make fewer <laughs> mistakes. With, with age comes stability, is what I think is happening here. So this... Uh, time-dependent rate phenomenon it is a power law decay function. It's a relationship between two things where one, a change in one results in a proportional change in the other. So it's a power law, and they can apply a power law relationship and try and figure out um, the rates of evolution in these viruses. Mm. And they have done that and adjusted the substitution numbers accordingly. And what they find, the uh, the clade of mammalian um, uh, foamies and lobe finned fish flurves 263 million years old. The range is 195 to 342 million years. And the age of the entire clade of foamy flurves, uh, 455 million years old, with a range of 304 to 684 million years old. And that would put it in the Paleozoic, right? Just, uh, just after. The Cambrian explosion. Right. So that is a time when lots of new life forms emerged and evolved, we think, because something was made that worked really well and that ended up being propagated. Perhaps things like homeobox proteins that could establish patterns and so forth. Mm. So you have all this new multicellular live life forms arising, and I mean, that's a, a gold mine for viruses, right? Wherever there are successful systems, there are parasites. Successful hey, yes. systems breed hey. parasites. Or something like that. Oh, no, no, that's <laughs> perfect. That's exactly it. Perfect. So all these, uh, I mean, I'm sure there were viruses before, right? Because there were single cell and few cell organisms around, but uh, you know, explosion in life forms, explosion in viruses. And that's probably when the, uh, wow. according to this, you know, 455 million. That's a pretty but cool Interestingly idea. enough, well, during that Cambrian explosion, and Stephen Jay Gould really made that famous because of the Burgess Shales, uh, several weird body types emerged that were were not brought forward to the modern world. Uh, a lot of them were discarded, so that it only ended up with basically, I think, was three body types mm-hmm. uh, out of like twenty that he could identify in all of these weird-looking organisms. Yep. And uh, that so the viruses must have died out too, then, because if they were host specific in certain lineages, uh, as some that, of them might have, yeah. Yeah. Right, so there must have been many, many, many more than we could imagine. So, you know, this the Cambrian explosion led Darwin to say, you know, yeah. natural selection can't be. It can't be that all these things <laughs> popped up all at once. Yeah, exactly. right. but we're not talking about overnight, though. No, <laughs> no, no. And, and Stephen Jay Gould got into a big fight with E.O. Wilson about the uh, rate of uh, speciation. You know, there, there, one is called punctuated evolution, and the other one is sort of a gradual mm-hmm. sensing of the changes in environment. The mutation rates stay the same, so the, you know that sort of thing. So, 
Stephen Jay Gould was a big fan of punctuated evolution, and uh, E.L. Wilson just couldn't stand that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and at the at the end of this Paleozoic period, the the end Permian extinction mm-hmm. was the mm-hmm. the greatest extinction event in the history of life on Earth. That's right, and uh, like over over ninety percent or ninety five percent of all marine species got wiped out. That's it. Yeah, was that the so, freezing over of the Earth, Alan? That was, I think this was due to a comet strike, wasn't it? Or, or it's not known? I'm not sure. I've seen um, some hypotheses uh, from some yeah, my, good uh, geologists. My, my <laughs> knowledge of this, uh, of this event is somewhat dated. So I mean, I there was a time when the Earth was completely frozen. All right. This is not, th- that was not this. Okay. Um, right. I think it's not been conclusively determined what happened. Got it. Um, there, there have been a few theories kicked around. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but what's interesting to me about this paper in that context is that here you see the retroviruses getting into these genomes early in the Paleozoic, and we've mm-hmm. still got these retroviruses around, even though ninety-five percent of their early hosts are gone. Yeah. <laughs> Highly successful. Highly, yeah. highly successful. That's there's right. a there's a really good book by Sean Carroll, uh, who is, um, I believe, a professor at the University of Wisconsin. It's called "Endless Forms: Most Beautiful: The New Science of Evo Devo and the Making of the Animal Kingdom," where he talks a lot about this explosion and what what we've learned from identifying homeobox genes that explains why there would be such an explosion. Wow. It's really good. I highly recommend it. Good stuff. Cool. <clears throat> All right. Anything else? I'm going to move on. Please. If, if not, that's, it's a very cool. I mean, that's the bottom line. 455 million years. That's the oldest for any virus so far where you have pretty good data suggesting it. A lot of people have said, wow, they've been around a long time. But this is a pretty good number based on uh, nice analyses. Mm. Happened in the sea. All right. Let's do some email. Mm-hmm. Sue Ellen writes, there's a story on our local news here in Atlanta. It's currently 58F and drizzling about a woman with a number of chronic illnesses that have apparently been linked back to mono that she contracted when she was 19 and to EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. I'm always skeptical of anything I see on the evening news that shouts childhood kissing disease linked to chronic illnesses. (laughs) You Twix folks and a BA in biology have made me this way, so I would like to ask you guys for your educated input on this subject. She sends a link to this story. The research cited in the story was done by a Dr. H. H. Balfour, Jr., who, according to PubMed, is at the University of Minnesota Medical School, so I guess he's reputable. But this quote from him in the article just seems, well, unsupportable, considering that nearly everyone has EBV in their blood, and I have not seen any studies that have definitely linked EBV to cancer or MS. Quote, Epstein-Barr virus is responsible for a number of chronic conditions, especially certain forms of cancer and autoimmune disease and even multiple sclerosis. Everybody with MS essentially has been infected with EBV. 90 to 95 percent of the world's population is infected with this virus. And so right there, not considering cancers and MS, we would have a huge problem solver. EBV is definitely involved in multiple sclerosis and several forms of cancer, such as Hodgkin's disease and an autoimmune disease, other than MS, such as lupus or even rheumatoid arthritis. Can you respected virologists shed some light on this? Have there actually been studies definitively linking EBV to the exclusion of any other possible cause with MS, cancer, lupus, and or any other autoimmune diseases? Or is Dr. Balfour's reach exceeding his grasp of the facts, so to speak? <laughs> It's apparently working on an EBV vaccine, so perhaps the proof will come when we are all vaccinated and no one ever gets MS or cancer again. (laughs) Just joking, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's not the only contributor, but it bothers me to see a proper scientist speak so rashly unless he is indeed just stating the facts. P.S. Big fan of all the Twix podcasts. I hope there would be a twee in this week in insects in 2017. Mm. Good job, Sue Allen. Must be something in the air in Atlanta. (laughs) (laughs) It's really good. And I mean, you you said it yourself. Most people, most adults are infected EBV with EBV early on, over ninety percent. If you get to college and you're not infected, then you will be there. It spreads via saliva, and it leads to infectious mononucleosis. But there are many malignancies associated with infection, for sure. sure. Burkitt's uh-huh. lymphoma, right. Hodgkin's lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, yeah. a lot. However, MS is another story. 
mm-hmm. really unclear. And uh, I quote from Fields Virology, the role of EBV in the pathogenesis of MS is still unclear. There have been a number of studies associating the virus with it. Uh, primary infection with EBV is associated with increased risk. And seronegative, EBV seronegative people have a low risk of NS, MS, but most studies have not found viral DNA or RNA in the brain uh, of MS patients. So I would say he is stretching to say that it's, it causes uh, MS because I don't think it's been proven. However, for the other ones, um, I would like to recommend this book that I'm almost finished reading called Cancer Virus, and it tells the story of the discovery of EBV and the recognition of its connection with these various diseases, and it's in the TWIV library, or TWIV bookstore. TWIV bookstore. Nice. Is that by Dorothy yes. Crawford? Yes. And I think there are a couple of authors, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's see. We'll give them Dorothy Crawford... And um, I can't see. Sorry. Dorothy Crawford. Why don't they put the authors? Did they, oh, Dorothy Crawford, Ingolfur Johannesson, and Alan Rickinson. I know Rickinson for sure. Yeah, so I think, Sue Allen, you hit it right on the head of the nail. You've uh, been well-educated by your BA and Twix. Mm-hmm. Yes. Not, not a connection yet with MS for sure. Dixon. Yes. Harold writes, Greetings. Longtime listeners to TWIV here in Cube land, where the temperature is currently (laughs) 75.7 degrees F, and the day is always bright under the fluorescent lights. (laughs) (laughs) Saw this article, or or a well-timed advertisement for a book about fat in Wired about chickens and the SMAM1 virus, human Adeno 36 virus and obesity. And he gives a reference. Um, it seems to be a claim that probably gets trotted out about diet this time of the year as clickbait. The article reads with to some questions. One, could eating chicken infected with SMAM1 virus be causing obesity? Could other viruses be causing the other forms of obesity? If SMAM1 causes obesity, shouldn't all poultry workers be obese because they come into con- close contact with the animal? Should obese people be avoided because they can give you <laughs> ad 36 and make you obese? Uh, why aren't all people who are exposed to ad 36 obese? Keep up the good work. These and other questions will be answered at 11 o'clock on the news. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the uh, Very good, Dix. Fox News station only. Um <laughs> Or, or CNN, because that's actually uh, fake news, as we learned yesterday. Right. So the next email is also on the same Wired article. So apparently this article came up and uh, brought up again this connection, which we talked about on TWIV18. Can a virus make you fat? TWIV18? That was about 450 oh. million years ago. Yeah. Vincent. <laughs> yeah gee, that's Paleozoic. That's Vincent, exactly. <laughs> Vincent, Dixon, and Allen. Back then I called you Dick. It did. And I uh, didn't realize you didn't like that. That's but, fine. Uh, it's, it's, it's discuss fine. adenovirus 36 and obesity. <laughs> and then we also covered it again <laughs> on TWIV 101, another great title, Sizing Up Adenovirus. And right. there, uh, Rich Condit had joined us. And Hamish Young spent his right. career working on adenovirus. So, Kathy, do you have any thoughts about this connection? I do have mixed feelings about it. In fact, I met uh, Nururkar, I think that's his name, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, when he was at Wayne State back in 2004, and he's since moved on to two other places. I think he's in Texas now. I think, I, you know, I think the data are relatively good, but he, he falls between the obesity literature and the virus literature, and it's One of those situations that you need really, really good proof for Mm -hmm. something to show this. And so it's, from what I can tell, it's mostly him working on it. And, you know, if other people jumped in and corroborated, maybe that would help. Mm -hmm. And I remember being contacted, I don't know, sometime in the 90s because I was still at Georgia and, you know, the, some reporter wanted to talk to me about it, and I just kind of freaked out, and I said, 
uh, talk to Marshall Horwitz. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's that's how I feel about. So it. there is yeah. this avian adenovirus where in chickens you can induce obesity by infection, right? Right. And that doesn't infect people, right? But I mean, people seem well, to be. Well, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, this SMAM, but but he was never able to import that virus into the United States. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I right. I can understand the difficulties in doing that, but I suspect that if you you really pushed it, maybe eventually you could. So then, yeah. so then there's this human adenovirus 36, which does seem to have some unusual features compared to the other adenoviruses, and the most recent literature points to an E4 ORF1 protein mm -hmm. that I think is different from E4 ORF1s in other adenoviruses. So, yeah. And that has been shown to do things to adipocytes, right? Right. To make them differentiate, which would be consistent with, you know, increasing body mass index. Mm. Right. Right. And there's a wealth of literature on the microbiome and its influence. Yeah, that too. I mean, that's, I think, so, yeah. I don't think that you, you can separate them. It's most likely that they're working together. Mm -hmm. One would think. And there's also, yeah. there, there's a directional problem in the causality here. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, you, you've got this correlation, okay, we, we looked at blood samples from a bunch of obese and non-obese people and the obese ones right. have a higher prevalence of adeno 36 mm -hmm. and they have different microbiomes in their guts or whatever other measure we're looking at mm -hmm. but are they obese because of the ad 36 or do they have ad 36 because they're obese yeah. the animal studies yeah. are clear or or is there some common risk factor to both things you know like people people who get lung mm -hmm. cancer because they're carrying carrying lighters in their pockets Mm. Right. Yeah, but Alan, the uh, work on germ-free <laughs> animals is pretty clear about, at least in animal models, that uh, if you take the microbiome of an obese mouse and, and uh, yes. transfect it into a germ-free mouse, transplant it, well, we would call that transfection. Right. No, 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 it wouldn't be transfection. And, so, and there's the another germ, word, though. There's the germ-free mouse is itself a very, very sick animal. Yeah, but not after they get these uh, conventionalizations, then they can yes. for as long as a normal animal. It's yeah, but it, they get it, they get obese. I've looked into a lot of that literature, and it's it's problematic. I'm not saying that it's not possible that that's what's happening, mm -hmm. but it it is. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a huge stretch to say that that is the what's main missing? driver, what's or missing? even or even a major driver of the obesity epidemic in humans. Oh no, I I totally agree. I don't think you can jump from animal studies to humans. I don't I don't believe that for this particular instance because the microbiomes are so different but at least in the animal model it appears to be consistent you can you yes can, you can take a, a skinny mouse and, and make, make it a an fat mouse no no right. and do the other way take a fat mouse and, and transplant or trans whatever you want to call it a fecal uh, transplant is a fecal good. transplant is good yeah. uh, after you've wiped out the other one with antibiotics and mm -hmm. the other one grows up and starts losing weight like crazy well wasn't that shown in a human Yes, they have the human studies too, but I think Alan is right on that. It's more difficult to control for that in humans. Yes. But animal models. Because uh, the other thing you can do with a mouse is feed it a high fat diet and it yeah. gets obese. Yeah, that's absolutely. Which is, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of that going on in the world today. So. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Exercise and <laughs> diet is the answer here. <laughs> I think basically you can be very comfortable around obese people. Don't worry, you're not going to get. <laughs> Not catch. Yeah. Um, and I think we don't know. There's some tantalizing hints, but uh, yeah. there's more to be done still. You know, if I were a good epidemiologist, I would go to all the sumo wrestling matches in Japan and see what happens afterwards. Do linear <laughs> studies. and Why do they get large? Because they eat a lot <laughs> oh, of Oh, they uh, get stuffed. That they, they eat them a lot. They purposely, purposely fat them right? up. They yeah, they're just almost like uh, Kobe beef uh, animals. I mean, they don't, they're, yeah. They're I think Kathy's right. This field needs to rare. expand, yeah, a bit, and get yes. more people working on this. this it is needs all to bulk up. Ooh. Kathy, you don't want to work on it. Uh, Thirty six. No, I haven't ever been tempted. <laughs> but, um, I just the the whole story. Whenever I hear something like this, I think about how long it took to mm. show that HPV is associated with cervical of course, cancer. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
or that smoking causes cancer. I mean, come on, that's just well, it's yeah, not it, a simple. It, it certainly, certainly doesn't help when you have whole in, a whole industry working against. You no, know, well, that's true, but show. I mean, still, the proof of it was a mm-hmm. long time coming. Alan, in this case, you would actually have an industry that would be trying to help you. <laughs> exactly, for- exactly right. Alan, can you take the next one? Yes, y'all who writes. I, I is that a nom de plume? That <laughs> no, was at the end um, of the email, you know. <laughs> Uh, right. Pakistani city launches new polio campaign after rare strain found. And this is an article that I think Vincent and I both tweeted about. And um, uh, so there was an outbreak of um, type 2 polio. Well, it was just in sewage. Just in sewage. Oh, right. Yes. No it, was, it was located in sewage. It was not um, an outbreak. Uh, this is surprising because they haven't been vaccinated against type 2 with OPV for quite some time there. Mm. They've gone to univalent vaccine. So according to the um, the theory on which the WHO has been basing the eradication campaign, um, there shouldn't be any type 2 polio left there. It should be gone. Mm. And it's yet it's still in the sewage. It appears on subsequent investigation, I've seen some other data about this they went around um the cdc and who collaborated went around to clinics in the area and they um when they phased out trivalent vaccination they um you know they issued this directive okay you only use monovalent vaccine from now on um but apparently a lot of the small clinics didn't get the memo and or didn't <laughs> feel like throwing out perfectly good vaccine that they still had in the fridge. So they found a number of vials of the older vaccine, which could have been the source for this. Um, apparently in response, they're going to wow. go back and immunize with Sabin type 2. Now they're immunizing with Sabin type 2, so they will definitely have type 2 in the sewage. <laughs> it seems so... <laughs> Weird, right? They're scared about yes. vaccine derived type two in the sewage, so they're immunizing with a vaccine yes. that will make more in the sewage. Yes, I don't get it. Hmm. I thought the response Maybe they don't get to this either. was so, <laughs> it's a double I negative. That what they were supposed to do was follow up with vaccination with um, inactivated. Virus. They should. I mean, that yes. is the WHO recommendation. No more That's OPV two. Substitute a dose of IPV two. And it seemed yes. to me that in this case, that would be if they have so much confidence in IPV, they should do it here. It's very crazy. Well, how much funding is there for that in Pakistan? Well, I think Bill Gates would help. Uh, if he could, I, I'm not sure to what extent Western NGOs are allowed to operate there, mm. particularly after um, you know the, a vaccination campaign was used by the CIA to try to track down bin Laden. And there's some, there's some bad blood about vaccination, if you will, uh, in Pakistan. Yep, I, I understand. So. Yep, uh, Rich Condit, are you there? I'm here. Can you take the next one? Sure. Doctor T writes, "Dear Twiv Lords, caution! Please do not try to pronounce my name. Call me Doctor T slash T Dog." <laughs> I am a material scientist with a PhD in nanotechnology from SRM University, India. I joined Deepak Skulka's Skukla's lab at University of Illinois at Chicago as a postdoc and now work on herpes simplex viruses. You might be confused about why I made a drastic change from material science to virology, but you will never know the answer because I am unsure myself. (laughs) It felt like a (laughs) really... It felt like a really good idea. <laughs> I have technically never touched a micro pipette earlier in my life. <laughs> now I can do a 384 well plate within an hour while half asleep or while listening to your wonderful podcast. Can you see the <laughs> wells? <Same> thing. <laughs> half asleep, I yeah. was introduced to your pod. I was introduced to your podcast by my colleague Joshua Ames, who is a patron of your podcast. Being a podcaster myself. YTY show, he gives a link to his uh, show, and an avid listener to podcasts, I was suggested by Josh to go listen to your podcast in order to improve my podcasting skills. In retrospect, I think he was trying to tell me that my podcast sucks. Hmm. 
when I started listening to your podcast, I was initially irritated as to why these people were talking about the weather so much. <laughs> but now, 20 episodes later, I like it and enjoy the <laughs> convo you all have. The day I seriously started loving your podcast is when I was listening to A Neff is Enough. And that afternoon, the Italian professor you were referring to in the paper gave a lecture in our auditorium. This was the first, after eight months of virologists around here, lecture I understood in full. To me, a material scientist, all the virology lectures were more or less protein, 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 as protein <laughs> interacts with protein, hence it's a bad protein. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> listening to your podcast and then listening to the author himself, I was suddenly able to understand all that he was saying from start to finish. That's pretty good I after love eight all your months, podcasts. I would say. It, <laughs> I love all your podcasts. This reminds me of that um, um, Gary Larson cartoon about uh, what a dog hears when you yes. talk to him. Blah, blah, ginger. Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 rover, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Food. I love Food, all your podcasts. Right. It now helps me understand a lot of virology I never understood <laughs> earlier. P.S. It's 14 degrees C in Chicago. Sunny blue skies. I love Professor Dixon. My hey. favorite podcast is... is uh, hdmorprocast.com Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality and hmm. Vincent has pasted I put his name in, you can I see why <laughs> Yes, <laughs> forget it Tejabarim I think it's Tejabarim, something like that uh, uh, his, his uh uh, analysis a fool of that tries to pronounce Dr. J, Dr. T's <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, analysis of a virology seminar reminds me of a faculty member and who's a cell biologist at UC Irvine saying, all the virology seminars are the same. They put up this life cycle slide and the virus goes in and then it makes its proteins and its nucleic acid. Then it reassembles and it comes out. Thank God I wasn't. Like, <laughs> subsequently, I was at a viral immunology uh, meeting, and the, on the very last day, I was having lunch with immunologists, and they said there was so much virology at this meeting. And I said, "Au contraire, there was not a <laughs> single virus life cycle slide in the entire <laughs> meeting." Right, <laughs> funny. That's exactly yeah. what we like. It's funny. amazing. Yeah. Parasitology is the cycles. same, except you guys know more than we do. <laughs> <laughs> Trudy, you want to take uh, Andrew's? Yes, Andrew writes, Dear TWIF team, I am a veterinary virologist studying avian viruses. I'm a big fan of the show and appreciate the diversity of viruses you discuss, including those that infect a variety of organisms and species. However, please can you stop referring to them as quote unquote, the kind that make you sick. Many of these don't cause disease in people, so I feel the tagline might need updating. Mm -mm -mm. Thanks. P.S. <laughs> it's been a cool but sunny six degrees Celsius today here in Surrey in the UK. Best wishes, Andrew. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for it. It I, has been brought up before, but I nope. Just, I, thank you the for The tagline stays. I like it. And I <laughs> wanted, I, as I discussed before, I originally wanted to distinguish between computer viruses. Mm -hmm. and I thought that would be a short way to say it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I we, we all know that not all of them make you sick. No. Certainly but, not uh, ones that have, that were around 450 million years ago. No. And Yeah, speaking of which, that's something we didn't say about the foamy viruses is that they don't make you sick. Uh-huh. Don't make you there sick. There are apparently no human there are, there are apparently no human foamy viruses. There are right. foamy viruses of a wide variety of other vertebrates, <laughs> uh, but all of them cause apparently lifelong persistent infections and yeah. no uh, no pathology. But computer viruses make you mad. <laughs> they do. Yes, <laughs> they do. Now we have one, two, three, four, five. We could do a lightning round here, here because go. they're all basically okay. entries in the textbook. So Mike writes, I love viruses. My first real introduction to viruses was when I picked up the second edition of Principles of Virology, and I went online to check out the authors. That's how I found TWIV and subsequent iterations, and I'm always looking forward to new episodes. I'm still hoping to see if there will be an immunology podcast. It looks as though audio immunity is fading into the sunset. Hope you all have a good 2017. Mike in Oregon. <clears throat> Dixon. Brock writes, 
Hoping for email number 23 so I can flinterize my virology <laughs> vocab. Thanks for the enjoyable education of TWIV. I heartily endorse a This Week in Bugs, though pronouncing TWIB will sound like you caught a rhinovirus. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to a long future of TWIV. I like flinterize. That's very good. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Alan. Dylan writes, Dear TWIV team, hello from Ch- Chile, Minneapolis, where the current weather is minus 5 Fahrenheit. Minus 21C before the wind chill. Mm. I also assumed I had missed a chance at the textbook last week, but I guess many listeners had the same thought. Thank you for <laughs> another great year of TWIV and best wishes for 2017. Kathy. Jarrett writes, hello again. I'm writing a second time in hopes of securing a copy of Principles of Virology. As Dr. R. had mentioned in TWIV 422 that he had only received a few emails in response to this most exciting of giveaways. One of those emails was mine, so I'm sending another to increase my odds, (laughs) given that that is allowed. (laughs) If not, allow me to report that we are currently having magnificent weather in Austin today (laughs) at 21 Celsius and sunny with winds of 11 kilometers per hour. Happy New Year to you all. Jarrett. Rich. Diane writes, Hello, Twivsters. I hope I'm not too late in telling you how much I enjoy the podcast and that I love viruses. I listen to both (laughs) Twiv and Twim and soon hopefully more from your group of podcasts. I enjoy the banter as well as the information you share every week with us. It is currently a brisk 40 degrees Fahrenheit in Lewisburg, North Carolina, which is located about 30 miles northeast of Raleigh, and we are anticipating our first snowfall this weekend. This might give me some time to sample Twip and (laughs) Twivo to decide which or both to add to my playlist. I look forward to many new and exciting podcasts in 2017. Keep up the wonderful work. Lovely. I guess when it snows in North Carolina, everything is paralyzed, so mm-hmm. people can't work, yes. right? Same Absolutely. thing in Atlanta. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah. How often do you get snow in Atlanta? Well, lately it's been happening about once a year, but it's not really yeah. true snow. Like last weekend, it's just a sheet of ice and everybody stays home. <laughs> yeah, they let the schools out, you know. I- <clears throat> You know, All right. Happens. Let's do some picks. Hey. Trudy, you got a pick for us? I do. Um, hold on a Sorry, second. it's a ways down there on the page. Yes. Um, I actually don't have a science pick because... Um, <laughs> Not many of us do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it's an, an art pick, and I know that everybody here on TWIV loves art. We do. And um, my birthday was just this week, and my husband commissioned this artist in Finland to uh, paint portraits of our kids nice. and cool. it, oh. they turned out dark. really really well and I like her style and I know it wasn't too expensive I don't know how much it cost but I know it's affordable so um, I just put her website there it's lovely yeah so cool. I, I saw the, the paintings on Facebook yeah cool so we were not too far apart in birthdays of course but right. many years apart in actual years because you're much younger <laughs> than I am uh, but the first few weeks of January yep a good time lovely alan what uh do you have for us i have the thing that uh came on in my headphones when i was uh, just setting up and <laughs> uh this is radio garden it is a um it's a neat little site that brings up a, a globe um and you see little dots all over the globe and those are radio stations mm. so he's uh, the Developers of this site have taken all the radio stations that stream their audio online, mapped them by location, and you can tune around to listen. And it actually it puts a little static on it to make it more like listening to the radio. <laughs> um, so you can just spin, spin the globe. I think it normally detects right. your location initially and gives you something close by, but that's not very interesting. So you, <laughs> you spin the globe and see what's playing on the, oh, the rock station in Reykjavik or, or see what the station in Buenos Aires has on right now or Neat. Just, uh, just click on whatever you like. That's and, very cool. It's a lot of fun. There are a lot here in New York. <laughs> of course. So yeah, that, you, can, you can zoom and pan and everything. Nice. That audio static is like the audio equivalent of skeuomorphic. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I that's right. think there's a way to turn that off, but I have not played around with the settings this is, very much. In Newark, New Jersey, the fire department plays jazz. Yeah, why that's shouldn't they? Cool. WBGO is right next door. That's it. That's a great station, by the way. But it says Newark Fire Department, WBGO. Why it's an it? NPR station. Oh, it's it is? Great. It's, I listen to it every day. It's, it's wonderful. Brooklyn College Radio. 
Yep. This is neat. Yeah. And uh, Fordham has a nice radio station, and so does Fairleigh Dickinson, and that's a lot oh, yeah. of colleges do. But there are none in Greenland. Well, oh. <laughs> hey, let's start with... You know what? That's, there are that's no, a real shame. There are no TWIV listeners in Greenland either. What? Yeah. Really? We'd have to translate it into Danish. Do, do we know that for a fact from the download stats? Yeah, I don't see nobody. There's nobody in oh, Greenland darn. listening. Yeah. Oh, well. Gee. Rich Condit, what do you have? Falling back on falling back on my science fiction uh, library again. <laughs> the uh, this is a classic nineteen from nineteen sixty eight. It's the Death World Death World trilogy by Harry Harrison. So it's a science fiction book. It the trilogy is published in one book, and it's basically your you know it's uh, chronicles the adventures of uh, and sort of interplanetary intergalactic uh, rogue uh, <laughs> traveler um, sort of maverick guy who uh it's it centers in the in the first book on a place called death world which is a planet that's been colonized that contains all sorts of creatures that are just really uh monsters and are uh, uh designed to kill any other living thing around and how they deal with them but it hmm. spawns off from there it's a a light entertaining read <laughs> That's right. A light kind of makes you sick. <laughs> Rich, you read this a long time ago. A uh, couple of years. All right. These are that both this one and my uh, pick from last year. I picked up from my uh, uh, sister-in-law on our uh, long uh, uh, road trip. Shortly after I retired, I visited her. Started talking science fiction. She gave me both of these. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Dixon, what do you have for us? Uh, my pick is for Rich, because uh, Rich has a friend who's involved in a around-the-world boat race. And this is the world's first energy-free, basically from fossil fuels at least, uh, speedboat. And I saw that on, of all places, Yahoo News, of all places, right? <laughs> it's it's, it's my favorite news. source of entertainment, I can tell you now. I love, I love going to Yahoo News. I just love it because three-quarters of it is fake. And the the other part of it is is reasonable, and I'm I'm surprised that they're still in existence, given that Yahoo isn't doing great. But anyway, Rich, this one's for you because it's uh, it's what's going to happen over the next ten or fifteen years, I think, to most of the. Uh, uh, it looks very, it looks very interesting. That's uh, quite a boat they've got. There. Yeah, and, and you it'll know, be interesting to see how that works. It's all out. about solar panels and and running without the need for wind or current or all that other stuff that other sailboats cool. use. Speaking of which, the uh, the uh, yeah, Monday Globe update is that uh, mm-hmm. Alex Thompson, my favorite, is uh, still in second place by a mere hundred and thirty miles, with wow. uh, just less than just less than eighteen hundred miles to go in he the can race. Almost so the they're mass break. Of his Sounds like gonna, he's catching up, yeah. right? He is. Uh, he well, he was as much as eight hundred miles Ooh. behind some time ago, uh, and he was in the lead for a while. But uh, right. it's been. Around this for a while, it's going to be tough to make it up because they're getting close to the finish. They're up uh, even with, um, uh, what is it, uh, Madeira? Uh, uh, yeah, they're just, just south of the, of the uh, Canary, Canary Islands. Islands. Yeah, sure, the Canary Islands. Yeah. So, the, so, so there's a go. wonderful scene in uh, Captain and Commander, the very last scene of the movie where they turn and they chase after the British... Ah, yes. Kathy, what do you have? I picked the information about M-Sphere Direct. So there is a link to a video, and now there's two videos on the – when you link to the M-Sphere page, it's two videos. But then you can actually get to some text. I didn't want to play the videos again. They have a new kind of submission policy for this ASM journal, and you choose your own reviewers – get their feedback, and then you submit your final manuscript to M-Sphere, either through BioArchive as a preprint or directly to the journal. Your paper is then vetted by the M-Sphere senior editors, and you know their decision within five days. They won't request further experiments or revisions. Your accepted paper will be published within a month. Of course, I guess there's the possibility that it 
won't be accepted. But <laughs> they don't it won't be published them. immediately, actually. But, so if like you are working, Ali sent me spam about this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I asked him for it specifically because uh, I, I just got this published. automated email from Mike. I was like, oh, what's up? Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they say if you're working on or recently completed a manuscript, consider submitting via MSphere Direct, the pathway that puts you in control. Yeah. So it this is a it's a very interesting idea. We were told about this about six months ago, and um, they're very excited about it at ASM <clears throat> because it takes away this issue of will they review the paper at all and will they pick the right people and so forth. And um, Arturo Casadeval, who as you know, we've talked about his articles here. He's very critical of the whole publishing enterprise at the moment, thinks this is a great idea, and then within two years, everyone's going to be imitating it. So we'll see. Yeah. You know, Dixon, I'm going to send you my paper to review. Would you okay? please? <laughs> I'll be happy and, to accept it for you. <laughs> and, you know, if this thing works out financially, then I will be probably be getting genuine spam about uh, the predatory journals copying the model as they did with PLOS. Or but, hands of spam. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. All right. But this, this looks like a very, very good approach. Yeah. It is cool. I might try it. Mm-hmm. All right. My pick is um, what Trump has been saying about vaccines this week. There's an article in the Times. It's kind of an anti-pick, isn't it? It is an anti-pick, <laughs> yeah. but I think everyone needs to hear this because this is this is bad news. So uh, the title of the Times article is Anti-Vaccine Activist Says Trump Wants Him to Lead Panel on Immunization Safety. This is just ridiculous. Why would you have an anti-vaccine person on a supposed panel to investigate vaccines because you want to get rid of the vaccines vincent <laughs> what other why would you do this at all be? why is this an issue why don't we do things that yeah, are i don't understand because i don't understand this is autism i don't understand the motivation it doesn't make any well, sense to me trump said he's seen a lot of people getting autism he says autism has become an epidemic 25 35 years ago you look at the statistics not even close it has gone totally out of control this is typical trump speak I'm totally in favor of vaccines, but I, I want smaller doses over a longer period of time. Same so exact do, amount. So do we. Same exact <laughs> amount, but you take this beautiful little baby and you pump. I mean, it just looks like it's meant for a horse, not for a child. So here is Dr. Trump speaking with experience on what a person needs to be protected. This just drives me freaking crazy, okay? And we need to speak out against this. Now, fortunately, uh, right the same day in uh, the Daily Beast... Paul Offit has a wonderful article in response. I don't know how they got him to write it so quickly. It's, the title is Paul Offit, Trump Needs Vaccine Experts, Not Conspiracy Theorists. Trump could have turned to any number of reputable experts to learn about vaccine safety. Instead, he went right for this for this fringe. And this... <laughs> unbelievable. Now, Unfortunately... I mean, as we all know, this is part of a pattern. He goes directly right. to people who are the antithesis of reason on all subjects, and all of his appointments so far have followed exactly that pattern, and this continues exactly that pattern, and this is what we have. It's a, a life of resentment and, and rejection followed by payback. I can't believe how much influence... By somebody who was born overprivileged. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. But I can't believe how much influence Wakefield still has. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, the guy has been repeatedly outed as a fraud. It's been shown that he had manip- manipulated evidence and committed other forms of serious professional misconduct. Uh, he himself even later admitted to the existence of multiple previously undeclared conflicts of interest. Uh, and on top of all that, the results shown in his papers have been disproven over and over again through rigorous scrutiny by multiple other legitimate labs and researchers to people who exactly have decided the lancet the yes. lancet fully retracted the paper yeah, and the editor course. apologetically admitted that it was utter garbage and then 10 of wakefield's 12 co-authors later published retractions stating that there is no causal link yeah i mean what more do you want right well the, can, there there is no level of proof that will that will cause the hardcore believers to reverse their error. Uh, this is, I am sure that Wakefield will be on this committee. 
Of course. Uh, I'm absolutely that sure. Is, uh, oh. Yeah. No if doubt about it. If oh. this committee even gets put together, Hopefully but it's it it, the bad things are clearly afoot. I just don't understand why Trump is bothering with this. There are other issues he needs to deal with, but... You must have a oh, supporter with a not, lot of it's money. It's not about priorities at all. It's not about a, a rational priorities. It's yeah, about yeah. whatever... Yeah, you're, you're not dealing with somebody who has an agenda. You're dealing with somebody who has urges. Mm-hmm. Kind well, of not like only that, he, clickbait. He, he might yep, owe yep, somebody exactly. a favor that supported his candidacy that, whose child has autism. And, it's not even that. And they're not convinced. It's not even that. It's this is going to get the headlines and he can tweet angrily about it. <laughs> that is really all and there then, is. then if any scientist speaks out, he will call them a second-rate scientist. Or <laughs> failed <laughs> or worse. Mm-hmm. They'll yeah. cancel his grant. <laughs> Unbelievable. Because he's the authority on that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, then the ASM uh, yesterday sent a letter to President-elect Trump, signed by oh. Susie Sharp, who's the president of ASM, Stefano Bertuzzi, pre- CEO of ASM, and Ron Atlas, who's the chair of the PSAB, Public and Scientific Affairs Board. Um, ASM supports the universal use of licensed and approved vaccines. So that's the tone of the letter. <laughs> Unfortunately, what they should have said, you're way off base, man. <laughs> but they didn't. They're being diplomatic, so not sure he will read it. No, of course he won't. This, <clears throat> these things, all, all these calls to, oh, you know, what Trump should do is this. It's just, it, it's not even worth your breath. Sorry. We're in for, in for a rough, uh, how many ever years it is. However, Two however long with it lasts. an impeachment. Yeah. <laughs> well, if he gets impeached, then we get get the other guy. So. Yeah, which is not going to be a huge improvement. Yeah, but at least he understands you have to do things a certain way and yes right he's yes. more predictable he even if we don't like what the predictions are yeah. yes well there are some people who were being nominated for cabinet positions who opposed trump's view about the involvement of russia and the election tampering mm-hmm. they actually came out and said that i think yeah we'll see how long that lasts too right well yes yeah. that's exactly right <laughs> they may be uh, deposed <laughs> Anyway, I think uh, it's important that we keep on top of this and Absolutely. speak out. Absolutely. We will certainly do so here on TWIV, but every scientist or any person who believes in vaccines, and you all should, should speak out as well. Write on your Facebook, say, this is nonsense. We support vaccines. Unfortunately, you know, I've posted these articles on Facebook, and of course there are people saying the, the final story on vaccines isn't in yet. It, the science isn't <sighs> done. I mean, nonsense. <laughs> No, more no, this just furthers the need for effective science communication. Far, far more importantly than anything you post on Facebook or elsewhere online is it, particularly if you live in a state that has or if you're if your senators are Republican or if any if your representative is a Republican, call them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, because there because there is difference. a lot that Congress can do. And the GOP is in charge of Congress, both houses right now. And not all of the Republicans in Congress are on board with the Trump approach, and they need encouragement to oppose. So yep. get on that. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. they respond to that. They do. I, mean, I, mean, I, think I, I the, live in a uh, state where this is not an issue because <laughs> <laughs> my representatives are already well against this. Right. Yeah, the, the recent attempt to uh, change the ethics committee Met with a lot of outcry from constituents, and that's yes. one of the reasons why that was scrapped. All right, that is TWIV424. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIV, also on iTunes, and of course on your cell phone. There are many apps that you can use to get podcasts, and you can just subscribe to any of the podcasts for free over there. Think about supporting us. We have many ways you can do that. microbe.tv slash contribute, Patreon, uh, payments through PayPal, or just using our Amazon associate account to do your shopping. We get a little percentage of that. And of course, our our Schwag store, where you can buy mugs and t-shirts and zip zip hoods and all that stuff, right, Dixon? That's right. There's I, nothing like drinking a cup of tea on Saturday morning, doing the crossword puzzle in the New York Times, sipping out of my Twip cup. Twip cup. That makes I it. I love it. You I bet. love it. Our guest today... Here in studio has been Trudy Ray. You can find her at Gertrude Ray on Twitter. Delightful, Trudy Ray, I must add. Thank you. Sorry? 
It's a delightful Trudy Ray, I might add. Thank you. Thank You're you. a pleasure to be a guest. This was a lot of fun. Thank we you. Did, we you had, had a, a you had a podcast for a while. What happened I to that? You, did. Got, you had kids, right? I had kids, yeah. and I switched <laughs> careers. So you don't feel you want to do that anymore? No, I do want to do it. I actually do want to do it, but um, I need... Um, I would like to have a partner to do it with, and... You want to talk? Vincent just raised his hand. <laughs> yeah, let's... Uh, sure, let's, yeah. Uh, I have an idea. I have an idea for a um, outgrowth of what you did. Okay, We should yeah. talk about it, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Virologist at large. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it, and we, we appreciate your support as well. You're welcome. Thank Dick, you. Dixon de Pommier, not only is he here at Columbia <laughs> University, but you can find him at dot org and parasiteswithoutborders.com where you can find his textbook for free exactly thank you dixon you're welcome Vincent. you know whenever i get mad at you it's, i blame donald trump you know what it's uh, <laughs> that's because my middle name is donald i i'm gonna change my middle name let's get this over dixon with. <laughs> donald de pommier oh boy that's right that's right kathy spindler is at the university of michigan in ann arbor thank you kathy thanks this is a lot of fun <laughs> rich condit He's an emeritus professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville, now in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. <laughs> There's a delay because it takes longer for the signal to reach Texas because that's how big it is. <laughs> Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Okay. Title. Titles. Do you have to rush out? Oh, no. Uh, your family's not saying where the heck are you they are but i can i can stay a few more minutes a few more minutes okay we got titles yep flurvergnugen it's that must be you trudy yeah what does <laughs> well, it mean I like it. nothing i just saw the i just saw flurv and it just made me think of vergnugen <laughs> <laughs> i, I, I had that German same thought title. actually i like it that good <laughs> no, too never. i think it's kind of neat and you know last time you were here we had a German title. A German title as well. And it was also Friday the 13th last time. It was? It Get was. out of here. No, I'm not joking. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. How about that? <laughs>